Generic greetings and welcome to Science Insanity, a show dedicated to bringing my love of science fiction and all its plot hole fill silliness to you. I'm Sai, your guide through the insanity, and today we're going to be talking about planetary defenses, what types there are, how they work, and what they do so that you'll all be prepared and ready when unspeakable horrors from beyond the stars start invading your world. Or when the tax man shows up, either or. But first, this video was chosen by Size Patrons, and if you'd like to support the channel, see our content a day early, and give feedback on future topics and videos, check it out! And if space bucks are short, spread the video as far and wide as possible, your AI overlord demands algorithm fodder. And with that, on to the video proper. Planetary defense, anti-invasion measures, protection and security, hippity hoppity get off my property. However you want to phrase it, more often than not in sci-fi there's going to be someone or something that wants to take, destroy, enslave, or conquer what you have because they can. Or because you have something they want, like the universe's only source of VTubers, which I'm sure is a valid reason to invade a world literally named dirt, or nuke it to dust, depends on your views. So, due to the never-ending hordes of invaders and greebly monsters, something must be done to protect your world and ensure that any threats can be held at bay. First, mobile, flexible defense. All the ships, weapons, and mobile assets capable of express delivering explosives to someone else's forehead. Second, static defenses. All the colossal weapons, space stations, megastructures, and fortifications that you build on, above, or near the things that you're trying to protect. And third, passive defenses. Things that may not actively do anything or move around, but can dramatically shift the strategies of any defender or drastically change the landscape of a battle. And since it's the most immediately understood, let's start with the active and mobile part. This is essentially your fleet. All of the fighters and capital ships, transports and shuttles you have to move men, materials, and weapons of mass defenses around to wherever they can do the most amount of those things. And because I have an unhealthy obsession with the number three, there are three separate parts of a mobile fleet that we're going to break this overarching topic up into. First is garrisoned forces. The most common and most immediately visible form of deterrence is parking a ship or two of active duty combat vessels directly above something important and glaring menacingly at everything around that's not identifiably friendly, then glaring even more at everything that is friendly to make sure that it stays that way. This is what we see in IPs like Star Wars. When the Empire wants to protect something, they park a Star Destroyer, or several, directly overhead, and then just sit there looking scary. Now, this may seem like a bad idea, because we often see these types of garrisons and defensive deployments just completely humiliated, but something you have to remember is that these types of simple garrisons are the least effective type of defense, and they're used for a very specific reason. They more often than not are meant to be a bar the enemy has to clear in terms of minimum viable forces. Essentially forcing an enemy to bring enough fleet resources or weapons or ships or whatever to defeat several Star Destroyers, and if you don't, you'll get slaughtered. It essentially acts as a ward to keep away unwanted elements like pirates, smugglers, and rebels that don't really have the resources to take on proper military assets. This way, you can guarantee safety for whatever you're protecting against the most common sci-fi threats that aren't like a full invasion without really needing to commit big resources. It's essentially a relatively ineffective form of defense, but it keeps away all of the relatively ineffective forms of offense, and a great example of this actually is in Rogue One, where we see the rebels have to send and commit essentially the entirety of their fleet to take on a relatively unimpressive Imperial garrison of a space station with TIE fighters and two Star Destroyers overhead. To stop a determined and peer enemy, however, you will need the second kind of mobile defense, a sector or quadrant fleet. Single ships are great and all, don't get me wrong, but they're tied to specific locations, they're often inflexible, what if we had a fleet of, you know, like 50 of them? Or a hundred? Or several hundred? that roam around an area in large groups, butchering anything that is an issue. Lo and behold, we get the second form of fleet-based protection. 
large sector fleets of active warships that patrol or garrison a number of worlds or systems. This kind of defense is great since it's flexible. Such a formation can spread out to deal with smaller issues like pirates as needed, or form together to confront full-on invasions and pose a massive threat to anyone trying to, well, breach into your space. While it's rarely shown, this is actually how the Federation deploys its forces in Star Trek. They have individual ships that go off for exploration and patrol and for security or escort duties, and generally when they need to, like in the Dominion War, they gather all of the vessels from a large sector together, combine them into a single overarching fleet, and then move those units around in groups of dozens or hundreds of ships. And, of course, one step up from a single sector fleet still relying on offense as your best defense, I guess we could say, is the principle of fleet in being. This is essentially lazy man's influence in real life. If the enemy outnumbers your naval assets, then just don't fight them. Keep your ships around, but safe, and the enemy has to permanently expend resources to prep for a potential attack without you ever actually needing to do anything. The German fleet in both world wars says hello. In sci-fi, it's a similar concept, but cooler. Just like everything, because lasers, spaceships, and one-liners make everything better. Hundreds or thousands of ships make up your mighty fleet. A good portion are up and at them at any given time, but most are in dry dock or storage, anywhere from like half to two thirds. Even though these ships aren't actively doing anything, having a colossal fuck off fleet ready to blast Thunderstruck and blacken an enemy's skies is a wonderful deterrent to being invaded. Of course, this general principle of deterring invasion through overwhelming strength only works under a few specific circumstances and has a few downsides that go along with it. Firstly, it generally only works if you can create a fleet big enough to actually be a sizable threat or an overwhelming force if war were to ever actually break out. Or you have to actually be able to make yourself so prickly that attacking you becomes equivalent to fighting a blender with every man's personal inborn eggplant. The downsides of this kind of strategy as well means you have to invest an enormous amount of resources and wealth into building this colossal fleet, maintaining it, and keeping it modernized, up to date, and replacing older vessels as necessary. It's a tremendous investment, but on the flip side, if you ever decide that calling a crusade against whatever filthy alien lives next door is the good idea for your administration, then, you know, you've got the fleet ready and built waiting to go. So it's kind of pulling double duty. But regardless of whether or not you go to the full ridiculous extremes of building your massive fleet, having some ships is always a good idea because they can reinforce, relieve, and work excellently with the second type of defense. That being static defenses. These usually go part and parcel with garrisons or fleet assets since they both work really well together and are often codependent or they cancel out each other's weaknesses. The most common type of static defenses are, well, static? Whether it be an orbital platform covered with guns and hangars to the often reality bending mega guns anchored onto the surface of a planet or moon, these bad boys are giant and built for one purpose to sit near or above something worth defending, not move from that position, and kill everything that you don't want getting close. They often have heavy armor or protection and secondary surrounding weapon systems like anti air guns or fighter squadrons based out of them. They are the lowest form of static protection since they're often the approximate match in terms of resource investment as a battleship, with the downsides that they can't move and the upside that they carry way more guns and armor for the same approximate price. Defensive platforms and surface-based weapons and placements are essentially the most efficient type of defense you can build because they don't need any of the more complex systems that a spacecraft will, and that means that you can make them far more powerful, but they only specialize, or I guess I should say, they can only do one thing, which is defend where you've built them. They have no other utility or ability to really reposition. Some great examples that we can see once again heading to Star Wars are the Golan defense platforms. 
They are relatively small, and they have about the same weapons loadout on them as you would expect from a reasonably sized cruiser, but they are much, much more compact and much cheaper to build than comparable cruisers. Or we can look at the Expanse, where Earth has a huge network of giant railguns in orbit that are capable of doing everything from blowing up incoming asteroids, shooting down incoming missiles because they have this wonderful buckshot round, or vaporizing enemy ships from halfway across the solar system. They can't really move and they take a really long time to aim, but they are a static defense platform that guarantees anyone getting near Earth is going to have a very, very bad time. Moving up from that, we have the larger synergistic type of static emplacements, fleet yards, starbases, and dockyards. These are the gigabig space stations and sometimes smaller megastructures like rings that serve as both a defensive platform around a world and a hub for fleet assets to use. The starbase orbiting Earth in Star Trek not only has dozens of starships docked within and around it, but it has some of the most powerful energy weapons and torpedoes ever designed by Starfleet. If these types of installations come under attack, not only can they serve as the backbone of any defensive line, but they can also act as force multipliers, repairing, bolstering, or protecting fleets around them to increase their combat effectiveness. This is also where we see the cavalry mentality of planetary defense come in, holding out long enough and being prickly enough that an enemy won't be able to take you out before prior mentioned mega fleet rides to the rescue and turns the enemy admiral inside out. Now, while these structures are extremely large, it is very rare that you will ever find something star-based sized that is a purely defensive construct. Because these things are so big and so expensive to make, often they're going to be pulling double or triple duty with whatever their purpose is. They may have tons of defenses on board, but they may also be a civilian research station, or they may be a dockyard, or they may actually be a fleet yard where ships are constructed. This presents your defenses with the unfortunate downside that you have coordinated or centralized a shitload of resources into a single place with a single structure that makes it up. So it becomes a very large target for an enemy that may want to, well, cripple your ability to resist. And that brings us to the largest type of static defenses. Megastructures, Dyson Spheres, and Ring Worlds, and Giga Stations, oh my. This is simple. Take everything we've talked about before, only other thing to note is that they are now the size of planets. So take your very big space station, it's the size of a moon. A great example of this is from Star Wars. Again, during the Siege of Kuat Drive Yards, the massive orbital ring was producing Star Destroyers. It's essentially a giant orbital shipyard. However, it was also heavily loaded with defenses, and as the Rebel Alliance was attacking it, the actual drive yard itself was not only contributing its own firepower, but constantly refreshing and reinforcing the Imperial fleet, rebuilding fighters, repairing Star Destroyers, producing new capital ships to add into the fight, and generally causing the entire thing to turn into a siege. From Halo, we also see things like Dyson Spheres, called Shield Worlds. These are not just a colossal defensive structure with the entire surface being covered in guns and weapons and shields, but they're also safe staging grounds for any forces inside. A lot of these Shield Worlds have portals or wormholes to other facilities, so if one were to come under siege, as you would have to because there's no way to get around Dyson Sphere or Shield World, whatever, the entire fleet could be moved inside the structure to assemble safely before joining a fight outside. The only real problem with megastructures is they tend to be completely unviable for the vast majority of factions that may want to build something of such an incredible defensive nature, because it takes a lot of resources to build a ring world, much less creating a giant pocket dimensional sphere around an entire solar system. And that brings us to the last major category of planetary defense, passive elements. And this is both going to be weird and cool, but also a little shorter because there's just not quite as much to talk about here. And this is where we find all of the things that don't directly impact a battle, like planetary shields, the ultimate go away, I'm not answering the door when you come under attack. 
Star Wars once again coming in clutch. As we see on multiple occasions, planetary shields are nigh impenetrable, stopping both solid spacecraft and energy weapons from entering as if they had hit a solid wall. Something like this is essentially the most cost-effective type of defense you can build because it completely prevents a fight. You can just turtle underneath your shield while the enemy is outside and neither of you really interact with each other. The downside is, unless they go away, you're stuck under that shield pretty much forever. There are, of course, other types of passive defenses, like scrambling or interference. Maybe a world has an interdiction field that forces enemy ships out of FTL far further away than they would prefer, giving the defenders more time, days, weeks, months, whatever, to plan and organize their defenses without actually affecting combat directly. Maybe it's complex jamming equipment that renders guided munitions ineffective, forcing an enemy to get closer than they would otherwise prefer to use other more conventional weapons, or my personal favorite kind of passive defense, natural void terrain. And a lot of people scrunch their face up in confusion because space doesn't have terrain, not really. But this is sci-fi, emphasis on the fiction part of it so we can do what we want. And here there is one really beautiful example I want to use and that's from Battlestar Galactica. A colonial fleet yard and gathering point of the survivors of humanity was inside a gas giant by the name of Ragnar. This planet had the unique effect of producing EM radiation that messed with the Cylons, scrambling their sensors and degrading their AI. So using a planet like that to build a base and hide within is a huge defensive boon because it fundamentally disables the enemy's ability to really even fight back within that atmosphere. Terrain could also be something like building your defenses or stations within an asteroid field or within a very intraversible part of space. In Star Wars, Again, because that series is just a monster, there's a place called the Maw, which is essentially a region of space absolutely filled with black holes. So you can imagine that getting in there is probably very difficult. And the Empire built a whole bunch of special research facilities and star bases in there, where there's basically only one safe route in or out that they controlled with an iron fist. So with all of that having been said, go! Go, my loyal adoring fans, fortify every world, create fortresses and fleets and megastructures of plenty everywhere you go so that every enemy that looks upon you sees nothing but a hedgehog fortress of guns staring back. And if an enemy rolls up on your block, make sure that they remember for the rest of time that you will give to them nothing and take from them everything. And that is pretty much the video. A little bit longer than I normally do for these opinion pieces, but can't really be helped. It's fun to talk about giant space stations and megastructures. So, with that having been said, let's thank the patrons real quick who chose this topic before ending off. Thank you to David G, The Original, Augie, Eleven Bravo Crunchy, Terry Higgins, Pedro Munoz, David G, The Other One, Silencer, and of course, Vox Apollyon. Thank you very much for feeding Steve, my loyal food merchants, and I hope you have all enjoyed this. Outros are hard. Let me know how you would defend your stuff down below. Okay, goodbye.